Come if you want something to happen in your life. Come if you want, if you're, if you're tired of things going the same way. This is Jubilee. And God is ready to act from the heavens on your behalf. And if you miss it, whoo, another 50 years we don't have. I don't know if I'm going to be alive in another 50 years. I am seizing this moment. I'm seizing this moment for me so that the, 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 few, the, the next few years that I have on the earth, however long God will have them to be, will be in place according to heaven, will be blessed, no stress, no frustration, no death, Brah, man, no sickness. So I go to this earth with a bind and finish strong. That's what Jubilee means for me. All right? So I'm connecting with what heaven is decreeing over Barbados. And I'm standing and saying, Jubilee, if it's for Barbados, it's for me. Whether you are a son or daughter of the soil, if you live here, it's for you. Connect and receive. Amen. I'm tired of paying a mortgage. I want God to handle that. I'm tired of sickness attacking. I want God to handle that. Amen. I'm tired of things all this. Blah, blah, blah. I want God to handle that. This is Jubilee. And Jubilee must not pass until I see God's hand move on my behalf and your behalf. So we're coming together. We're connecting together. We're praying one for another. The prophetic word will go forth. The decree will go forth. And liberty will come. Amen. Amen. I believe God. Amen. So Tuesday evening 6.30. And we're flowing together. I'm not preaching today. I'm not, I miss preaching but I'm preaching today. <laughs> and then... Our Jubilee celebration is continuing to July for our Apostolic Convention. And um, Apostle, Apostle Michael Scantlebury, he's all geared up and ready. Apostle Pepe Ramnath. Um, Pastor Pepe, he flows in ministry of healing and miracles. And he will be ministering the first three evenings. Well, Sunday morning, Monday and Tuesday. Um, you got to be here. This is our season. I believe that. And as he teaches the word, then he will release the word of faith over our lives for healing. And then Apostles Canterbury will be here also. He'll be ministering Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And if God wants to change it up, he'll change it up. That's what we have planned. The rest is in God's hands. So get ready for AC 2016 powerful ministry. Wow, Jubilee, Jubilee, Jubilee. By the 30th, Barbados is going to be in position by the 30th of November. I'm decreeing it over this nation. Amen. Even the debt of this nation, which is a burden that God will intervene. Amen. Praise God. Because when Barbados is in debt, I get tax higher. You too. So when that debt comes down, our taxes come down. Yeah, so there won't be a burden upon the people. But we will truly move forward in the grace of God. Amen? Praise God. Coming to minister the word of God is one of our young men. I can safely call him young. Uh, thank God for his ministry. He, he is so ready. He's not waiting for the introduction. But Kevin Campbell, he's going to minister the word of God. We thank God for him and his ministry, even as a partner of this ministry, wherever God takes him. And I know the word is going to be great today. God bless you. May God anoint you, empower you, equip you as you minister the word of the Lord. Please welcome our brother Kevin. Blessed good morning to the church. Can we all stand? It's so good to see um, Apostle and Pastor back out with us. Amen. 
We love Apostle, don't we? And Pastor, so good to, to, to have you back safely. You guys excited about this week and the Sound of Jubilee celebration? Yeah, Apostle, like he was ready to go for it there. I was like, come on, Apostle, go. Go on. Let's, um, let's turn in the, in, in, in the word to John chapter 17. Just before we just before we begin to read, just let's lift our hands to heaven. Let's just begin to pray. Pray in the spirit. Pray in your heavenly language. Believe the Lord is going to stir up some deep, deep waters within us this morning. I believe that the Lord has already started to do that. We've already heard the prophetic words about moving into the deep and about trusting the Lord as he takes us and launches us out into the deep and the glory of the Lord covering the earth like the, the waters cover the sea. Come on, begin to pray in your heavenly language. Come on. Come on, don't whisper it. Come on, let it out. Take us into the deep, God. Take us in to deep, deep waters this morning, God. Take us into deep, deep waters, God, that, that we can't navigate by yourself. Come on, overflow us, Holy Spirit. We're tired of the shoreline. We want more. We want more. We want more. God, you said out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. Come, come, Holy Spirit. Give us a fresh outpouring this morning. Take us into the deep. Come, let's spend another 60 seconds just connecting with heaven. We want to get all that God has for us this morning. Amen. Stir it up, stir it up, Lord. Come, Lord, take us into the deep, God. We want the depths of your spirit this morning, Lord. We come against fear even now in the name of Jesus. We come against timidity even now in the name of Jesus. When we step forth, God, we step forth into what you have for us, God. We launch out into the deep. We launch out into the deep, God, into what you have for us, God. Oh, we're not going to miss it, God. We're not going to miss it. We're going to launch right into it this morning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right. So we're reading out of John chapter 17. We're going to read the, the entire passage and then we'll, we'll focus in on a, a couple of verses. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you for I have given to them the words which you have given me and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you and they have believed that you sent me I pray for them I do not pray for the world but for those whom you have given me for they are yours and all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them now I am no longer in the world but these are in the world and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. 
while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I want us to pay special attention to the, the last couple of verses. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me i have given them that they may be one just as we are one i in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and I, I will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You may have your seats. Father, unpack this word to our hearts this morning. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of John 17. That's about three weeks of sermon there. But there are a couple of verses that I do want to, to capture again, and I'll, I'll pick those ones out. Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Skip to verse 20. I do not pray for these alone. But, for also, for, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Anybody see some similarities in the prayer of Jesus? That they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus is praying. How much of us know Jesus gets his prayers answered? Let's just start there. Jesus gets his prayers answered. And Jesus shows us his heart and his intention as he prays for all those who are his and will be his in the future. He was praying then. He's praying for all those who will believe uh, by the word that the, the disciples will preach. And he, he gives us in a nutshell, well, he, he gives us a long prayer. But in a nutshell, he's praying around some major points. 
I just want to pick out a few. He's praying that we all may be one. He's praying, number two, that the oneness that we have would be exactly like the oneness which he and the Father shares. No other oneness, that oneness. And then he tells us why. Point three. That the world may believe that the Father has sent the Son. You see that in verse 20? Pull back at verse 20 for me. We see it there. He's praying for all of us who will believe in the word, verse 21, that we will all be one as you, Father, are in me. Right? We see that. And I in you, that they also may be one in us. And this is it. Why? To tell you when you're doing a good speech or a good presentation, you start with why. He gives us why. That the world may believe that you sent me. He repeats it again in verse 22. The glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Wow. He's praying for us to be one. He's praying for us that the oneness that we have is the exact oneness that he and the Father share. He's also praying that we get perfected in that oneness, and we'll probably touch on that a little later. But he's praying it so that the world may know that the Father sent the Son. And that they would believe. God's intent is that through the church, through the church, collective, corporate, he would demonstrate to the world that he is God, that he and the Father are one, and that the Father loves the church, loves each of us as much as he loves Jesus. Father knows God knows, I don't know if you know, but I know too, that this world needs a revelation right now of God. And God has entrusted that to the church. We are the vehicle through which the world will believe that, G that the Father sent Jesus into the world. We are the vehicle. And despite all the facades that people put up, people are searching. The world is crying out. People are eagerly expecting a manifestation of the sons of God, beloved. People are waiting for the church to show up in its splendor. And you know what? Jesus will get his prayers answered. They're already being answered, and they're going to be answered in an even greater way once we come into alignment with the prescription that Jesus laid down for us. So Barbados is crying out. God knows the U.S. is screaming out. The U.K. as well. People are hungry for God. Some know it and some don't. And Jesus is saying this is exactly what I have called the church to. And this is how you're going to do it. You are going to look like me. You are going to look like me. You're going to share the oneness that me and the Father share. Wow. People are going to be looking at the church and saying, wow. There is a God in Barbados. Amen. There is a God in heaven and there is a God in Barbados. 
turning the world upside down. It's God's intention for the church. With the powerful words that he gave us. And he's praying. I want to just underscore there, so we get into this, that this is for all. This is for all. Hear what Jesus says. I'm not only praying for you, I'm praying for all those who will believe in your words. This is not for a lone pop star, a lone preacher, a few elders, and a few intercessors. This is the call upon us all to be one. None of us gets left out in this prayer. Jesus' intention is to invite all of us into this oneness. We have belittled church. We, we didn't even know it, but we have belittled church to, to just a little weekly activity. Where we come, we hear a good word, we buy this, the, the, the CD or get the MP3. We fulfill our duty for the week. When Ephesians 3 10 tells us that, that it was God's purpose that through the church, through the church, he would reveal to the principalities and the powers the manifold wisdom of God. Wow. Beloved, it is not even only just going to be the people around, it is going to be the principalities and the powers, both, both and, and, and we can check the Greek words for those that is both, and uh, angels, evil and good, who are looking on, saying, wow, look at the glorious church which Jesus is bringing forth in the earth. And they will not be able to comprehend what God is using us to do. Let me move quickly. That we all would be one. Beloved, we need each other. We need each other. Over the last couple of weeks and months, I know that it has been a recurring theme in the church about love. But the Holy Spirit is underscoring something, beloved. It is not about our own personal agendas. At the beginning of the year, and I mentioned this probably last time that I was speaking, you know, God gave a prophetic word. You know, about smashing that idol of self. And God is after that demon in the church, beloved. Because it is not about me, me, me. It is about God's agenda. And it is about all of us flowing as one, as J Jesus and the Father are one. And the greatest level of living is not independence. It is not independence. It is interdependence. It is interdependence. We can, under, we can unpack that a, a, a bit more. But Jesus demonstrates that. And Jesus calls us to that. Check Jesus' relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit and how they operate. It wasn't a one-man show. I purposely read all of John 17 only though because I was going to plug a few verses. Just to show us how Jesus is relating to the Father. Jesus is not in a competition with the Father or the Holy Spirit. They are operating in perfect unity, which comes from love. Love is the bedrock of that unity, beloved. They're not in heaven playing rock, paper, scissors, you know. Who's the greatest? Come. That doesn't exist in heaven. There is perfect unity that is born of love. And Jesus is inviting us as the church into that, into that heavenly community, into that heavenly reality, and to live that out on the earth. And as I said, it is born out of love. The inner life that the Trinity share is love. We 
we don't have time this morning to unpack the Trinity. We believe in the Trinity. We, we, we are firm on that. But the oneness that they're talking about here is born out of love. It is love that they're discussing. It is the existence of God. God is love. And it's not something that he does. It's who he is. That's why unity springs forth from him. Because God is love. It is manifested in their relationship with each other. The nature of love is interpersonal. The reality of love is interpersonal. Love demands an other to be loved. It is other oriented. There must be at least two. <laughs> it is about the other. It is about being for the other. Now understand, it is other oriented. It depends a lot on, well not it depends a lot, it depends solely on the nature of the lover. It depends on the nature, solely on the nature of the lover, not the object being loved. Because while we were yet sinners, while we were yet dead in our sins, Christ died for us. It was not what we did. It is that God loved us. It's not that we loved God. It has nothing to do with what they did to you. I know this is, I know it's really difficult. I don't know any nicest thing that you want to hear. But it's the truth. It does not depend on what they did to you. It is the nature of God that he has put inside of you that determines that you love that person. It is your nature. It is the existence of God and it's the existence of us in the church. Then it's relational. It is other oriented. There must be an other to love. And then the other thing is, is that love gives. That's the nature of love as well. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. That's the nature of love. You, you give. But the thing is, is in, that in God's equation, in the love that exists in the Godhead, It's not only that they love us when you're unlovable. But the love that they give is this all kind of love. It's an all kind of love. So that we can say that love gives all. So that when God is commanding us to love him with everything, it is not because he's just demanding from us something that he himself has not already done. The father loves the son. We read, we read the, go to the, the, the first couple of verses of John. Go to John 1, John 17, sorry, from verse 1. But you see in Jesus' discourse a lot, Jesus is just there. Like, the father has given everything to the son. Beloved, the Father has given everything to the Son. Jesus, responding to his Father, says, you know what? Your will I will obey. I will do whatever you want to do. Jesus turns around, looks at us in the earth and says, hey, I am going to give them all as well. Don't think that God giving his only begotten Son was just something light, you know. Jesus is the apple of God's eye. So love is self-giving. Love gives all. Love pours out in its entirety everything. That's why Jesus could say, you know, there is no greater love than this. Than that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Giving it all. Do 
And just by those couple of things, we can see how oneness and unity occurs. Where it is springing from, from love. It's the existence of God. It's how God relates. But then, when you look at the functioning, when you look at the functioning of God, I told you to turn to, to yeah, right. So check, check how, how Jesus is operating there in the, in the first couple of verses of John. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. They are operating in perfect love, beloved. You see the functioning there? Sometimes if you just read John 17 in a hurry, you miss it. But look at how Jesus is giving all the glory to the Father. Jesus is saying things like, listen, you have given me all authority. I, don't, I didn't get it on my own. These disciples here, these are the ones whom you have given me. I didn't get them on my own. The message that I have given them, I didn't come up with it on my own. You have given that message to me. And listen, I have glorified you on the earth. And you know what? The work that you gave me to do, I have finished it. And now I'm reporting to you that it is done. It is not my own agenda. Jesus has gotten all authority from the Father. But he is letting people know it is not about me. I am living in a perfect oneness with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And I know the verse doesn't talk much about the Holy Spirit, but understand something. I'm just going to plug this here quickly. You know how Jesus was conceived? By the Holy Spirit. Jesus went up into the wilderness, right? When he came back out, what, what was he? Full of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus got up in the temple and started to read Isaiah 61, what did he say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This was not now, oh, this is about me. This was him glorifying the Father, glorifying the Spirit, and showing that this is an operation in perfect love and in unity. He is not in any ways feeling slighted by the Father or the Spirit. You're greater than me. Oh, I feel, I feel a little insecure. No. And I'm telling you, that could take us a while to unpack. We got to move from there quickly. But if you read 1 Corinthians 13, when they talk about love and the functioning of how love operates in unity, it tells us things like love does not boast. You don't see that in Jesus. It is not self-centered. It is other-oriented. It does not only consider itself, but considers others. Beloved, this is the kind of existence, the kind of relationships, and the kind of functioning that happens in the Godhead and that God has designed and is praying for, has already prayed for, would operate in the church just as it operates in the Godhead. I didn't make that up. John 17 shows us that. So we have a high calling. The good thing is, is that Jesus has prayed for us. So we're going to get there. Moving quickly. As I said, it's a high calling. 
but I want to underscore something right there at the point of high calling, is, is that love is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not something that we conjure up on our own, beloved. We are asking the Holy Spirit to come in our life, cultivate his work in our hearts, and produce love. Like the Father loves the Son, and as the Son loves us, we need Holy Spirit in order to get this kind of love. And I'll touch on this a little bit more later, but don't get caught up when people are walking around with the, with the you know, all of the humanitarian campaigns. And they, they, I mean, there, there's some good in that and everything. And, you know, it's just always about the other person, you know, it doesn't have anything to go, about God in it. But, you know, they have their own definition of love. Beloved, we don't have love in the genuine sense. Unless we have God. First John tells us that. God is love. <laughs> and beloved, God is destined it for the church to be the vehicle that spreads this frequency, this sound of love throughout the earth, beloved. Beloved, there is a frequency. It is a, a sound. It's love. And, and, and if I was to title this message, I would call it the invitation to play in the symphony of heaven. Because Holy Spirit wants to release a sound of love all throughout the earth. And he is inviting us into the symphony to play with him, the Father and the Son. Love released through the earth. That changes the globe, beloved. Things that United Nations cannot accomplish, beloved. And they're, they're doing some good. But beloved, we have a higher calling. But the quicker we realize that it is about Jesus and not ourself, the quicker the idol of self gets smashed. We are free to love God with all. We are free to love people with all. And our selfish ambitions get pushed to the side. You know that Jesus said that by this everyone will know that you are my disciples, right? Again, he shows us how the world will know. By this, men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other. All right, let me, let me start walking and start getting on with it. And Jesus is praying. Because if the church can get this, we can fulfill our mission. Say so there is a perfect symphony playing in heaven. Jesus is inviting us into it to join in the band. And there's a world over there that needs the symphony. They need to hear it. And the Holy Spirit is the great conductor of this symphony. And he's releasing a sound into the earth, beloved. The frequency of that sound is love. And I chose the analogy of the symphony deliberately because of two Greek words we find in the scriptures. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. At another point, when Jesus is speaking about praying, He says in Matthew 18, 19, he uses a word in there. He says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And that word agree there comes from the word symphonio, which means to be in harmony 
or to be in symphony. And I want to read it from the Amplified. The Amplified would say, if you will come together and harmonize, or the Amplified actually uses the words harmonize or make a symphony. Now, this isn't that we come to, to a meeting with somebody who has some similar ideas and we try to conjure up something in the flesh, but it is when two of us come under the direction of the great conductor, we are filled with the knowledge of his will that, that, that is told us in Colossians 1 verse 9, and Paul is praying that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will. We have this will, we know what is going on, and this is a work of the Spirit Not for our own selfish desire, but that it will result in the world knowing that Jesus Christ is God. So we have no other motives. Beloved, hear what it says. Concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them. By my Father in heaven. That's the symphony that God is inviting us into. Remember that I told you that the frequency of the sound is love in the symphony. That's, the, that's, that's what we're playing. And beloved, sometimes we bring some attitudes with us in the church that Holy Spirit now has to work out of us in order to play in the symphony. This isn't pointing fingers at anybody because all of us at some time have probably had to, to go through some of this and the Holy Spirit has had to work some of this out of us. To be able to get, to be playing in the symphony in the way that the conductor is expecting. I've listed a few categories for us. Some things and some attitudes that the Lord has to, to get out of us if we're going to play on the same frequency. The first one we see in 1 Corinthians 13. If you, if you speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not love, you are what? A noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. The noisy gongs. We could pray in the spirit all day, but have not love, beloved. We are in the rock, we are playing on the, a whole nother frequency. Shabba dabba do, whatever. You're not playing in the same band. Beloved, it's not only about what we do, it is the motive behind what we're doing. And the Holy Spirit is saying, if you're gonna play in this band, it has to come from love. It has to come from love. Then we have the off beats. You know, they always got that buddy who just can't seem to keep time. You ever look around somebody in service and wonder what song are they clapping to? Marching to the beat of their own drum, wanting their own way. Holy Spirit is conducting the symphony. Holy Spirit is at the chorus. And them don't reach the verse. Out of time, out of time, out of time. Beloved. Or we got the right thing. We know, we know what Holy Spirit wants, but it is just at the wrong time we're coming in. Off the beat. The Holy Spirit is going to work that out of us, beloved. Because Jesus prayed. Then there are always those who we can consider the show times. We call them the show times. At the drop of a hat, they are ready for the stage. Ready for the performance. Lights, camera, before you can say action, they are there. If another person is playing, that does not matter if they got a solo piece. They're going to be up there in the front blowing the horn because the spotlight has to be on them all the time. 
Beloved, if we search our heart, there are times in our life when we are part of the show times. Then they got the tone deafs. Just don't know what the frequency is at all. You want to know where you pick up that key from. Like somebody karaoke it is here. Just death. Or disobedient, you know? Hard, hard. <laughs> just can't hear, just not open. The air is just clogged up. Holy Spirit was going to break that off of us. And you got the big breaks. I call them the big breaks. The one who's waiting for their opportunity. We're talking about oneness, beloved, and how we function, yeah? Just waiting for the opportunity. If you, if you miss, and give them the mic to close in prayer, it's all night prayer meeting just start. Or the sermon that they were preparing for the last 15 months. This is now the opportunity to release this. I am waiting for my opportunity. Apostle tell me, pray. What? Come. <laughs> it's my time now. Wow, beloved. Then they got some in the symphony who just like to blow their own trumpet. We love to blow our own trumpet and beloved again. Some, if we search our own life, we would see where there are parts of all of these, traces of these in our life. And we're asking the Holy Spirit to eradicate them out. But nobody in recognizing that blow my trumpet. Play so good today. So you know you got to call around to get some Affirmation. Just want some people to pat you on the back to say, oh, job well done. And you know, you're grumbling. Like, nobody didn't realize that if I don't sing in the band, if I don't play in the, if I don't play in the band or sing in the worship team, that them ain't saying nothing. Nobody didn't realize that he's the best singer in there. Nobody didn't realize the riffs that I play upon that, upon that saxophone today. When nobody ain't telling me how good you was after church. Beloved, this does not exist in the Godhead. Then you got the lip sinkers. I don't know what it's called, them and they're just playing and they ain't really playing nothing. But the hands moving. Not a sound. Or the singing. So the so 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 apostle the elders have, have given a command and it's like, well, I don't really want to look disobedient, but I really ain't feeling that one at all. So let me just fake it till I make it. And think that nobody you see, and Holy Spirit is just there like you in the wrong band. Then they got those who think that the band just keeping them back. This band here, they, 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 they just ain't ready. They know who's me. Uh, I see next big thing. I can be bigger than Rihanna. I can solo. 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 Beloved, it is not about me getting there before you. It is about us getting there together. It is about all of us getting there. Beloved, if I get there, the, 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 the onus is upon me to look back. As Elder Harris is talking about the height. Look back and see where you are. If you are in a battle, if you are in a fight, run to the front line with you. Because listen, you are part of me and we have to overcome. We got to get through this together. We are one. Then the God wants to just ain't playing at all. And who ain't care to play? They ain't even gonna fake it. A command is issued. You ain't feeling that one. So I ain't playing. 
Beloved, that is a very dangerous place to be. A very dangerous place to be. Especially under covering and under leadership. If you got a challenge, address it with your leaders. Do not be found like those who are grumbling. Those who found themselves in disobedience, beloved. The Holy Spirit. The church, beloved, belongs to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is giving direction through the leaders of the church. That's how God has ordained things to be. It's called order. It's called order. Get in order. Get in order. And though there are all these different types of persons, these, these well not persons, these types of attitudes, these, these things that, that work against our oneness, beloved. And I specifically withdrew the, the, the word persons because we, we, we're, not, we're not pointing at persons because, they, as I said, they find their way in our hearts at different times and we don't even realize it. We've got to be on our guard all the time, that, you know, because as, as Jesus said, you know, he was not only praying for oneness. Because when we come into the body of Christ, you know, people come into the body and, and we are one. But he was also praying that we be perfected in that oneness. So that it is a progressive work on our hearts. So we always got to be checking ourselves to see, am I being divisive? Am I doing my own thing? Am I, am I running against uh, the, the, the vision of the church uh, under the inspiration of the spirit? You know, I, am I just trying to blow my own horn? Am I trying to be up front? Am I just trying to be seen? Am I just trying to get there before everybody else? Am I just tired of how slow they are moving? And ask the Lord, Lord, check me and bring me into oneness with the body. And bring me into oneness with the Godhead. If not, we are missing it, beloved. You probably heard me say this a, a number of times. I remember one preacher saying it, and it just stuck with me. Lord, shock me now. Shock me now, Lord, not then. Beloved, we don't want to get to the end of the race and then be like, wow, I completely missed it. We want to ask the Holy Spirit to come show us where we are not playing correctly in the symphony. When we are out of time, we want to ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts, beloved. But there's another great word that describes the symphony. Remember I told you it was two Greek words that I drew the analogy from. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Beloved, though the Holy Spirit is working, we must cooperate. Amen? But there's another word that, that describes this, this great symphony. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And that word there that we use a lot, one accord, comes from the word homo. Thumadon, homo thumadon. It means with one mind, with one accord, with one passion. And if you look in your Strong's Concordance Dictionary, you would see something, something like this, that it is a unique Greek word used 10 of the 12 times in the New Testament in the book of Acts. It helps us to understand the uniqueness of the Christian community. The uniqueness of the Christian community. We are unlike any other. Homothumadon is a compound of two words, meaning to rush along, move fast, and in unison. The image is almost musical. This is what they say. The image is almost musical. A number of notes are sounded, which while different, harmonize in pitch and tone. Beloved, this is the uniqueness of the Christian community. 
And though we are different, and though that the Holy Spirit ascended, and, 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 that Jesus ascended, sorry, and gave gifts to men, and that we are all being given different gifts, that the Holy Spirit, like a musical, is conducting everything like a symphony in our life and through our ministries and all of this, with one accord is the word that is being used there to describe this great symphony. So when God is ready to pour out his spirit, he calls the ecclesia together, he calls the church to get together, gets them to come into complete agreement, to comply in, in their mind, in their speech, in their actions. They are now all in symphony. And boom, Holy Spirit comes like a mighty rushing wind on the day of Pentecost. This is what the church, this is what the world was waiting for, beloved. And God chose to do it through the church. Only when they began, or when they attained the symphony. Remember that the disciples had just come from quarreling about who was the greatest. Back in Luke, they were like, who is the greatest, Lord? And Jesus was telling them, if you won't be great, go low. But Jesus ascended, and they're just there together, and they're going after what God's agenda is, and they're saying, he told us to tarry, he told us to wait, so we are under his guidance, we are under his direction, we are all in symphony, we are waiting for something, and then suddenly, beloved, know that God is about to do something, where the suddenly of God rips through the nation of Barbados, and he's going to do it in the church, but the church has to get together in the oneness that operates in the Godhead, and we usher that into the earth, beloved, we could miss it. Because we could be looking around to see if something that one of the prophets said came, comes true. Well, let me wait and see if they really can go to Jubilee. You know people are saying it. Don't look at me like, uh. When the church should be coming into agreement and saying, listen, Lord, if this is what you have destined for Barbados, I agree. I come into full, complete agreement in my mind, in my speech, in my actions. I comply. And with that oneness, beloved, we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Even if it is not time, we will pull it into time. That is the power of agreement because we get whatever we ask for when we are one. And it happened on the day of Pentecost. But you know something about the day of Pentecost? The day of Pentecost was a divine reversal of Genesis chapter 11. In Genesis chapter 11, you know Genesis 11? The Tower of Babel. Here they get together. They come together in one. They say, we are going to build something. Hi. And you know why they said they were going to build it? To make a name for ourselves. But God wasn't having that. Because God destined that there was only one name through which people were going to come together and have that kind of dominion and power in the earth. So God scrambled their language. Finished that up. But on the day of Pentecost... When they were all together in one place, the Holy Spirit comes. He get the, the clothing tongues of fire come down. And they began to preach in other tongues. And everyone heard the message in their own language. Now, the message of Jesus is going to go across the globe. It has gone supernatural now. Now, nothing shall be impossible for us who believe. This oneness, nothing can stop them now. The church. That is why I said I was going to come back to humanitarian efforts. 
Because without God, they cannot succeed. It has to be about the name of Jesus. It has to be that God is going to get the owl, the glory out of this. We are the most powerful agency on the planet. God destined it that way. If we were coming to oneness. But then, not only then, 3,000 added to the church in that one sermon, that one day. But then it continues all throughout the book of Acts, beloved. Revival is breaking out. Beloved, heaven has come down and it is shaking the earth through the church. By the end of Acts chapter 2, people have already sold all they had. Now they're breaking bread together in the temple with gladness and simplicity of heart and all of that. And they use the, they, they use the same word again. One accord. Continuing daily with one accord. It doesn't only start in one accord, beloved. It continues in one accord. Because anything that ever is going to matter or anything that's ever going to last, beloved, has to be built. Built in that place. In Acts chapter 4, they get threatened. They say, let's stop preaching in that name. The guys go back. It says in Acts 4, 24, when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord. Beloved, the symphony cranks up. Let's go, guys. Come, get the horns, get the bass man, get the drum. Everybody, everybody, let's go. We are going to pray. We are going to ask the Lord in one accord. And they start to pray. And when they had prayed, Acts 4, 31, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit again. And they spoke the word of God with boldness, beloved. They go on. Acts chapter 5. Miracles, signs, wonders are continuing to flow. Acts 5, 12. Through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's port. In Acts chapter 8. They said Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, verse 6, with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, unclean spirits coming out with a loud voice, many who were possessed, many who were paralyzed, and lame were healed, beloved, and joy. There was a great joy in that city. Beloved, Barbados needs a restoration of the joy that can only come from heaven, beloved. It comes through us. We get into position and we release the symphony of love across the land. It continues all through Acts. One accord. You look for it. Look for the times when it talks about one accord. Just as Jesus prays for it in John 17. I wasn't sure if I was going to go here, but I want to give one more example. It's not quite of the symphony, but it's about oneness. Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit. Wow. That you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. That you strive together. Suna gonozomai is the word that is used. Don't say that word too fast. But it is a word that is talking about battle. 
And it is a word that is talking about fighting, beloved. And it's just easing a little away from the, from the thing of the symphony. But we're still on oneness. Paul is talking about the fight in the spirit. Now, if you know anything about Paul, Paul, having seen all the miracle signs and wonders that he did, having written all the books that he did, how much of you would agree Paul was a pretty, pretty mature guy in the spirit? Was still facing great opposition in the heavenly realms. And Paul has not become puffed up. Paul has not said, well, I know how to pray. Paul told the Corinthians, listen, I thank God that I pray in the spirit more than all of you. The man's prayer life was buzzing. But here he's still humble enough to say, listen, I need you to strive together with me in prayers to God. Beloved, there is something necessary about the corporate prayer of the church. Because when we come to a promise, beloved. It must be all hands on deck to the fight. Every man to the battlefront. Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32. I have to go here. Numbers chapter 32. We can't leave this one. The tribe settling east of the Jordan. Oh boy. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that indeed the region was, place, was a place for livestock, they went to Moses, beloved, and they said, you see all the land there? The country which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Therefore, they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. And Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Beloved, the guy saw some land and said, let this look good. This is perfect for me. Moses, we can start right here. And Moses like, for real? The, whole, the rest of we going to war and you won't stop here? They later made an amendment. And they said, all right, listen, we can build some stuff and plants and stuff here. We will go over and we will fight with you. And then Moses said, all right, I, I will agree with that. But know this, know this, Moses said to them later on in that chapter. If you do not do this, you have sinned against the Lord. And your sin will find you out. In the same way, beloved, we are in a battle right now for our nation. We are calling everybody to the front line and saying, listen, you can't stop there. Don't tell me that you ain't like apostle. You ain't gotten a debt. You mortgage and pay for. Are you ain't sick in your body? So you know what apostle talking about. You don't need a jubilee. We can fight for jubilee. If you are already in your jubilee, come and pull the rest of us into it. We have to go up together. If not, you sin against us because this is a oneness that is required. It is oneness that is required. I can't step into something and just leave you there and say, oh, well, if you figure it out, you figure it out, brother. Because we want our names to be in the headlights. And beloved, I want to tell us this, see. Uh, and understanding the spirit of what I'm saying, it, but I'm serious about it because right now there is an entrepreneurial campaign going on in Barbados, which has its strength, and I applaud it. I am an entrepreneur myself, but we have to be careful, beloved, because entrepreneurism does not mean that we go at it alone. 
We got this individuality creeping in where it says, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. My business will be the first one to reach to, to reach the billions. I am going to be the breakthrough kid in, 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 uh, in Wall Street. I am the new one who make it in Silicon Valley. Me, 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 me. And we isolate ourselves and we don't realize that the interdependence that is necessary to thrust forward is missing. And then it creeps into the church. So we are no longer running with each other. Beloved, we have to watch it. We have to watch it, beloved. Everything that we do is for him. It is all about him. It is about our brothers as well. We love God with all. We love our neighbors as ourselves. That's the first and the greatest commandment, and the second one is like unto it. I want to put a plug right in there for husbands and wives to live as one. Husbands, we miss a lot because we think that the wife is the weaker vessel. We're, they're just there to do, to do the stuff around the place. And we miss the giftings, we miss the wisdom, we miss the knowledge, the understanding that the Lord has endowed them with to push us to the next level. And a lot of times we want to pray by ourselves. And the Lord is saying, no, 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 come, 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 come. I want you all to pray together. Because God uses the husbands and the wives as well. God uses marriage as a mystery to represent what? To represent what? Christ and the church. The same Christ and the church that he just said would be one. Marriage is a representation of what it's supposed to look like too. So it's not husbands here or wives behind. No. Husbands and wives, we are one. The two become one. So we're asking the Holy Spirit this morning. As we get ready to close, we're asking this Holy Spirit to tune us up and to tune us in. We need to tune up on our hearts, beloved. All right? We need to tune up on our hearts. We need to get um, forgiveness broken out of our life. It is crippling us, beloved. We are here instead of light years ahead because of what this person has done to us. But this is something that we have to fight for. Decades after the early church, the Holy Spirit was, was, was poured out in the early church. Paul was still writing to the, the Corinthians. Paul was still writing to the early church saying, listen, I beg you, agree with one another, man. Paul was still trying to say, listen, I see some are Paul and some are Paul has come, come together in alignment. Yeah, because it's something to fight for. Because when you, when you relax, you find yourself not realizing that you're moving apart and not together. So we need Holy Spirit to come search our hearts and say, listen, come, come, get, get me in tune. Get me in tune. You know, like when you, when you come to the band practice and your clarinet. You're right, your clarinet might be off and you go, you go fix the reed or, you know, you go find the right key first. You, you, the instrument needs tuning. We got some pride, some boasting in our hearts that the Lord just needs to smash right off of us this morning. We need to tune up, beloved. How do we get that tune up real quick? I talked about fully compliant earlier in three things, speech, mind, and action. But with our speech, beloved, we want to stop speaking negative things about each other. And sometimes that's really hard. But beloved, just think about what the Holy Spirit is saying about that person. Say that. If you can't find nothing to say, say what God is saying then. All right? And we know that his thoughts toward us are precious and more numerous than the sands on the seashore. He is full of love for each of us and everything that comes from him is love, beloved. So we can find the right things to say about persons. 
Now we just need to say the right things, period. We need to come and bring our speech into alignment with what the Holy Spirit is saying. With what the Word of God is saying. We need to confess the Word, beloved, and not anything else. We don't get into the idle chatter that goes on about how bad things are. Yeah, because we got the solution in our mouth. Yeah, we have the Word of God in our mouth. And that is what we are speaking. The next thing is the mind. We're having our minds renewed in the Word. Beloved, we want to run at the same pace now. All right? We want that all of us are full of the Word. We want that all of us spend time in the Word. So when we come together, we are, we, we are full together. We can edify each other. And we can all be filled, as Paul is praying in Colossians 1.9, with the full knowledge of His will. It's in the Word. We want that to be our reality. And the Holy Spirit, I know He's begun already. He's begun in my life. The Holy Spirit is going to tell, tell some of us to turn off the TV. To turn off the other media. And get back into the Word. Get our reality from there. But the other thing is, is praying in the Spirit for your mind. Sometimes we're thinking too much in the flesh. We need to be praying in the spirit, as Paul is saying, praying in the spirit. You're praying, your, your spirit is praying. You're speaking mysteries in the spirit. Your mind is unfruitful, but your, your spirit is praying. Have you ever been praying in the spirit, and then when you're done, right out comes whoosh, the word of the Lord. You didn't even think about that. You don't even know where it come from, where it came from, but it was the right thing for the right time, beloved. Because it keeps you sharp. Because there are things that you cannot know in your mind. There are mysteries that you can't.